All right, we have our first question. Um, so one question that's come to my mind recently concerns plastic. Um, China has stopped accepting our trash and um, we have a great Pacific garbage patch and a great Atlantic garbage patch and a great Indian Ocean garbage patch. It doesn't get any press um, where Mauritius is. Um, and I just wonder, um, seeing as plastic doesn't completely ever biodegrade, what does that look like going forward? Um, I've been asking this question as a um, financial person. Where is the money in cleaning up the ocean? Um, and, and, and how do we get to that part where we are actually incentivized to clean this shit up? As the ocean's expert, you get this one. <laughs> so, um, so a couple of things. I think Lewis might have an interesting perspective on whether actually um, plastics are actually degrading or are there new forms of bacteria or microbes appearing in our oceans that have never existed and that is now feeding off the plastics, which I think is uh, an interesting perspective. But, but I, think, um, no, I think you're spot on. You know, one of the big challenges is how, you know, how do we create the economic you know, mechanisms and um, incentives where the plastic can be seen as either a resource that can either be recycled or put through or... Um, I mean, so I think the broad consensus on what's happening with plastics is that at some stage, um, you know, 10,000 years from now, there will be a layer around our seabed and our surface where it's been an era of plastics, right? And um, it, it's clear that the global value systems are now shifted that we're in, rem in a remarkably short period of time, we're talking about the last two or three years, where we went to plastics being one of several issues to be, you know, plastic being a defining issue in many countries, where there's such strict policies that have been put in place, like in China and like in Rwanda and Kenya, where they've banned plastic bags here in California. Um, so we, you know, so I'm confident that we'll move to an era, you know, a post-plastic era very quickly. Um, and so there's, you know, two parts to answer your question. One is how do we incentivize the economics in that post-plastic era? So how do we make sure we're not developing materials that are more damaging um, because they may have a greater carbon footprint? So for example, there are a lot of people who are developing uh, straws made out of bamboo, but that bamboo actually has a higher water footprint or carbon footprint versus, you know, paper, but paper uses a form of glue and that glue is actually toxic, it's banned in Europe versus seaweed and algae and some of that's more sustainable. So, you know, the, number one is how do you move to that new economy and I think that's an interesting model to actually create economic uh, incentives um, through kind of value shifts to build alternatives. Number two is then what do you do with what exists um, right now with plastics in the oceans? Um, to what extent is there kind of market mechanisms for that so that you can use the plastics and it can be recycled in as, you know, bitumen or something in the, in, in the streets? Um, or is there going to be, um, is that something where you just need a public intervention and a multilateral fund um, to actually um, go out and be, it becomes a public goal, good to, to clean that up? So I think that's going to be the that, that's going to be the challenge. I think in terms of um, uh, post plus, I am now confident, I wasn't two or three years ago, but I am now confident that we will find new alternatives to plastics. I think there's a lot of innovation in the biotech world. I think the economic mechanisms and the cleanup still has to be worked out and I've not yet seen a, a comprehensive package. I've seen a lot of experiments but nothing at scale that's going to, to scale up. So I'd love to talk to you offline if you've got ideas about that. About that. Uh, just just real quickly, uh, since Nishan sort of alluded to, uh, uh, so, you know, um, scientifically, what's going to happen, I'm not sure anyone knows. Uh, I had the good fortune to be at an event uh, last week where I was able to see presentations by very different scientists than what I am, which is a biochemist. And uh, in particular, what struck me were people uh, showing off their uh, seafloor uh, mud samples. So these cores of, of mud that are used, that can be correlated to tree rings in some cases. They're a history of what's been deposited in the ocean. And I, I, I think that we're going to have the human plastic, the Anthropocene plastic layer uh, that, you know, if, if our species continues in the deep, into deep time, we'll look back and say, oh yes, that's when, you know, our ancestors followed the oceans with plastics and there's, you know, a layer of particles. Um, but what's interesting is that the concern about microplastics uh, in seafood um, is actually driving a lot of innovation and incentivizing innovation in in, in fish farming of one sort or another, in artificial uh, seafood replacement products, in fish uh, 
fish grown in, in you know in in the laboratory uh, you know from individual cells, and so in a way the problem with microplastics is incentivizing you know hopefully some technologies that will help us to restore fisheries you know maybe in in a best case scenario. So I think we're stuck with the layer of plastic probably, but. But but this is this has made this has forced us to think of creative ways uh, that that we can protect ourselves from the plastic, and in doing so, we might we might uh, help fix some of the problems we've created. So. I'll just just one bead, which is, you know, we say fight capitalism with a better capitalism, and certainly with regulation too and incentives. But uh, we have a plastics company that is fully biodegradable, fully compostable, edible plastic. When Before I came to Dubai, I worked with Adidas a lot on these shoes, which are from reclaimed ocean plastic. There are ways to fight this problem with better capitalism itself as well. Um, I, um, I wanted to know what you think is the relationship between trauma that we have and the fact that we do eat animals who... Um, are suffering and you know we're talking about connection with nature and nature is speaking and so we have billions of animals that um, that are killed I'm not sure exactly the statistic but we have all, every day maybe just because we eat them so the it's really easy to stop eating animals and decrease a lot of pain in the world as well as climate change environmental degradation in the oceans. So I'm just wondering how, I mean, that's my opinion. And um, so how much does trauma have to do with the fact that we just can't stop eating meat and thus causing so much trauma? We'll, we'll later find out what happens when we continuously eat animals that are tra traumatized themselves in tiny little cages, um, yeah, and then slaughtered, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I don't have an answer to that, but I, I get what you're feeling. And um, there's a, I think there's a great uh, bit of Dr. Yoon's um, ideas on this that you can read about. Um, I, I empathize very much with the point of view that we uh, pick up this behavior pattern like a thought virus and we're not strong enough when young to fight it or our own need for personal care and self-care uh, prioritizes over this concern that sits in the back of our mind forever you know and um, um, just and I've written about the times my kids when they were young were going through processing this I think the one thing that uh, is elsewhere out there is culture and people wanting to preserve culture and uh, in their culture they farmed this ate that um, my wife is Cajun she grew up on three foods her family's been in the industries she doesn't want to lose her culture lives here you know and wants to hang on to her culture so it's not that it's this or it's that it's her culture it's her style it's her people and her identity and i do think the burden in it, like we have at indie bio obviously many plant protein companies and alternative ways of dealing with this with cell-based meats and hybrid products but what we need very important to do is you know I keep saying you can't feed the world one hipster at a time. We need to find a way to. So I wasn't trying to throw that one out there like a joke, but like glad I got a laugh. But the, but the, it's very important that we enable cultural expression, and not uh, and not be sort of have an imperialist approach to telling people what to do. We need to enable their way to stay in touch with their culture through these new foods that we're making which is, I think, really, really, really important. Any other thoughts from the panel? Or next question? OK, let's go to the next question. All right. There was a comment about China moving very rapidly on environmental issues. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so on China, um, 
obviously there's a lot China's a very complicated country right so in the sense that uh, China effectively has you know eight big provinces and plus Hong Kong Macau um, for China to make decisions uh, there's a kind of group of seven the state council which is a cabinet goes through down to provincial governments and so when a decision takes place at the top um, it has to cascade through several layers you've probably read a lot about the anti-corruption clampdown in China over the last kind of four or five years a lot of the anti-corruption clampdown has mainly been around environmental standards so what's been happening has been a lot of um, you know factories and others have been skirting environmental standards in terms of you know effluents and waste and so um, because of various things about corruption and paying inspectors and so that has been where a lot of that clampdown has actually taken place so number one um, we're seeing signals from the very top that they're getting very serious on you know environmental crime and clamping down on that number two um, indicators of the environment is now getting reported to the very highest level in a way that doesn't exist in the US or in Europe today. So under the Paris Agreement, we're now talking about these what's called nationally defined contributions. There's all sorts of um, debate about how you're going to ver verify and validate um, what's being tracked. But in China, there's a very complex set of metrics that's reported in. In the same way that today a central bank, you know, the Federal Reserve in the US tracks all financial transactions, they're trying to do that in China for the environment. Right. And so, that, so that's kind of a second uh, signal that that's being done. And yes, they're going to get it wrong to begin with, you know, different level of measurement, but at least directionally. And then number three, um, from the very top, um, uh, Premier G, who's the um, you know, president right now, um, he defined a, um, as you know, China has their five-year plans, but he defined a 25-year vision for China. And he called this the beautiful China vision. And so in um, Chinese, I know others probably speak uh, better than I do, but um, he talked about the um, green mountains of gold and uh, blue rivers of silver. Um, and that concept of an ecological or beautiful China was meant to be a signal that uh, China can only be successful financially if the mountains go back to being green and the rivers go back to being blue. And that's been an extremely powerful concept that's really galvanized all of China in a way that we're just not seeing in the US or in Europe. It's very fragmented here in terms of debate, but from a top-down perspective, that's what we're seeing in China. Yes, there'll be things that will go wrong, things will not go um, you know, in a straight line, but we've seen a lot of progress in the last five years. I certainly have, or those who travel to China, um, and certainly from the very top, we've seen that, that willingness. That's a story to galvanize. Yeah. That's a story to galvanize people, yeah. Okay, yeah, oh yeah, let's go. Okay, yeah, we'll go back there. Hi, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I know we were talking about, uh, you know, the sense of like digitality and like our interstates, and I was um, kind of trying to understand like what your thoughts were on kind of what it means to to have a digital sense of well-being, and and you know what what are some metrics or, or, or ways that we can actually like measure that. And um, there's I think like a lot of externalities when it comes to the way that we interact with you know our products like our, our, our cell phones, like the computer and like the internet, and not a lot of I think uh, clarity in how these things are, are, are affecting our lives and, and whether it's possible to have that embedded within new companies that are starting and, and new internet companies that are starting and um, being able to, to measure and track that or if that's something, um, or if that's a solution that can only come top down or. Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot in there. I mean, it's, it's a hard, hard question that I just, I think for me, it, it, it goes back to what we I suppose is what we are building collectively and we built this these incredible prediction machines is, is what marks or defines this digital empire we've created right it's the ability to ingest lots of data and then predict one step ahead and for me a metric of well-being is how we're using that to solve NP hard <coughs> problems uh, I, I think that 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 uh, from a regulatory level if, if they're that it has many regulatory Im implications, for instance. Uh, and the other would be sec security. And uh, I, I think there, again, I don't have any, any answers. This idea of technology versus the state and uh, coming back to paternalism, how much right does the government or a tech company have to entering our bedrooms or entering our thought processes? Uh, and who, who governs that? And with 
data, the good thing is, and with accounting and say even blockchain, is that for the first time we're looking at personalization at scale. So there might be opportunity for a decentralized regulation of, of these these prediction machines. And so I, I, I think that there's scope there where, where we can transcend governments as well as corporates to, to monitor and to regulate these, these engines? Uh, I think from a scientific standpoint to, I, I see this all the time, a lot of these software packages and even apps uh, have really transformed science in a good way, you know, basic scientific research. And when thinking about that, I would, I suppose, apply some basic test. Uh, does this platform technology and you know, computational technology, does this allow people to do deeper thinking or devote more time to deeper thinking than they otherwise would? And uh, you know, some of the software that aggregates scientific manuscripts in digital form, for instance, and and in the law legal industry is 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 has been transformed by this too. It's amazing not to have to go to a university library and photocopy uh, journal articles. Uh, it's nice to be able to aggregate them on your computer. This saves time to do you know, substantive thinking about things other than which stack is a particular journal located in in the medical sciences library. So I, I think that, that, that we do see these digital advances uh, really improving things. And I think um, uh, a friend of mine in the audience uh, has thought a lot about machine learning uh, enabling, helping scientists to assimilate literature that's, that's too vast for someone who didn't grow up in the field to, to understand. And I, I think there's, there's really positive things in that space. Uh, so, I, I mean, if I was to apply a litmus test and I was looking at, say, digital companies to fund, uh, if I was a VC, which I'm not, maybe I would apply this, this litmus test. Does this make people more capable of fulfilling their creative potential? Um, it's tricky. I look at it very much on the level of uh, consumption versus production from the point of view of an author. And one of my books was called Nurture Shock, a New Thinking About Children. And one of the things that jumped out of that is the incredible power uh, for children to do extended play, especially extended play when it was co-authored, I meaning you could share authorship of an imaginary scenario. It wasn't, you maybe were borrowing from, you know, some TV show you'd seen or a cartoon, but then you were make, making it your own. And I, the way I look at our digital life is very much through this lens of uh, how much of it are we just taking in versus how much of it are we, and, and when I say interacting, I don't mean liking and reposting, right? So the big difference between listening to a podcast, entering almost a transcendent state, half of what you're thinking about is what you're hearing on the podcast and half is your own memory banks and processing happening simultaneously. It's a state of mind. It's a state of mind that again is very different. One person could be scrolling through news and just being like an idiot. Another person could be scrolling through news that looks the same. Maybe even looks the same to your stupid crawling AI that says they know what people are doing and thinking. Uh, but it's not the same. And the other person is really heavily thinking and engaging with that material and bouncing around. And there's a meaningful difference between self-directed navigation through digital devices to learning, because you're curious, to being able to take in lots of information and it kind of coming at you. Um, fundamentally, looking at the fact that when I wrote Nurture Shock or started that work in 2007, your average child in the United States was watching three hours and 40 minutes of linear television a day. That was coming at them totally in other people's control. We, as you know, big smarty pants old people, moralize the fact that, oh, they're on their phones all the time. And I'm like, what do you, 10 years ago, three hours and 40 minutes a day of sitting there sucking in cereal commercials and whatever the Nickelodeon channel wanted to give you. And at least I'd rather have their thumb navigating it and taking control of it and being able to self-direct and learn a few things. So I think we have to be really careful about um, 
how we interpret this stuff, even the overflow of our email box, like at least a lot of it you can actually act on. You can say, I disagree, or I want to schedule a meeting, or yes, I will be there to pick up my kid, whatever it is. It's at least it may be nonsense, but at least active. And that's very different than just being a receiver, a consumer, and not a producer. Not co-creating with the world that's coming in. And do these tiny little tests for your digital well-being where you yourself decide for a day that you're just going to turn your phone completely off and you're going to go and read a book or you're going to go into Muir Woods or the ocean or whatever you're going to do. And when you do that, just see how you feel and just tap into your own being and how you feel and just keep doing these tiny little behavior changes and seeing how you feel and just that quantified self-process of taking your own control of your well-being in the digital tech era one of the most important things young people can learn how to do. We had a, yeah, we had a hand up over here first. Hi, so if you look at the history of education, uh, you find that it's kind of originally started to make good soldiers and good factory workers, mm -hmm. and over time that has been even further optimized by the systems that we have. And uh, Facebook isn't strictly intentionally optimized to make you like feel bad about yourself and disempowered, but it does because people you know post their highlights and don't tell you so much about their struggles. Um, what do you see as a way to kind of train people to realize that they are empowered and they can do things and that they have the ability to affect the world? Make education affordable. I mean. We as a society engineered a system where we knew that nothing was more important than people getting educated. And in that same period of time, we made education so expensive that people are saddled with debt, that uh, admission, that, that uh, enrollment rates are going down. Um, it's, uh, it's the, by, to me, like one of the most fundamental things. If you look at many, many societies that transformed themselves, it was through using education in a time for a tough economic period. Um, Argentina's done it. Ireland's done it. You can go country after country having done it. And uh, the, it's, it's savage that what we've done to sort of make education inaccessible and to me seems fundamentally designed to keep people from getting educated so that they don't vote with an educated mind. So also to follow on that, I would say that we need to maybe reconceive education uh, as, as proper education. So I think that much of what is done is training and not that training is bad, but but I think that a proper education, a useful education is one that teaches you uh, to think critically and to bring together uh, insights from disparate fields. And I think that having a well-prepared mind is more important for making innovations of any sort in any field uh, than it is that you know, you know, specifically, you know, how to do a particular task in the laboratory. That that can be learned, but but being able to uh, uh, toggle between big picture and details that matter, and being able to to deconstruct problems and and in fact identify perverse incentives is something that's sorely lacking uh, or just not common enough in education. And and if we had a movement more towards the basics of how to think, uh, you know, elements of logic, uh, uh, maybe, maybe many things would be better. And Mother Nature is the best teacher. Yeah, um, a number of years ago I read an article that claimed that the British common law countries, which is America, England, and Australia, had the extremely high level of climate deniers. And if you sort of, and it sort of made sense to me, and I think that we here in America today are so skeptical and we've created a system. It's good because questioning authority has its qualities about being an entrepreneur and it has its bright side, but we've become this society of not believing that vaccines are good, climate is climate change is real. So this this we've we have this system that's capitalism and democracy rolled into one that has and, and this common law that has created a lot of perverse incentives for us to just be skeptical, pathologically skeptical. So any comments on that? Just a quick one. 
Um, I think that uh, you know around that around that problem, we we need to we need to teach people that facts are not the result of an online poll. Like you know, there are basic facts that can be you know proven to the level of theory or supported to the level of theory by tested hypotheses, and these are fairly immutable unless you know great evidence to the contrary is provided. And people just don't get to decide that what they hope is right is the truth is the truth. And I, so I think that that somehow this gets to the educational problem: teaching people, you know, basic things like cause and effect, and the, you know, coming up with testable hypotheses and testing them, and empirically finding out what the closest that our measurements and abilities allow us to determine as truth is something important, especially when it comes to things like climate change and so so many other key issues. I think the the opinion and fact have been blurred in many areas where they shouldn't. And so how do you get that scientific thought process or that scientific rigor into a non scientific mind? Good question. Well, you know that's a really good question. Um, I don't have a good answer except to say that I think I think that inherently all people are scientists, whether they they realize it or not. I mean, we we do simple we test simple hypotheses every day, mostly uh, unaware that we're doing so. And people who may have a non-quantitative mind, let's just say someone who's really creative in different ways, maybe socially or kinetically, uh, they test hypotheses all the time. If you look at an athlete doing whatever athletic event they are there there's micro hypotheses in every move they make so i think that same with crossing the street you know crossing the street do you need to pick up your speed a little bit in order to make the countdown yeah, clock so, on so, time? Uh, so, well in san francisco uh <laughs> yes uh but but i i do so i think that i think that to answer your question if one could intervene uh it would be to teach people with different types of intelligence or different distributions of different intelligence types that all of the different intelligence they use in some way queries hypotheses and that's that's sort of like baked into life and that's an that's an okay thing and i think that that if you did that people who are not traditionally quantitative science who would we would think of as science oriented people would realize that that this is sort of this is fundamental to all thinking no matter what type i would actually not go so bottom up, which I think will play out in a very long run. It's it's a top down uh, problem for me. It's it's leadership. It, uh, the political system is has this perverse incentive to to obfuscate this boundary between opinion and fact, and uh, uh, especially in diverse countries. That's I think that's where the problem is stemming. And and a joint coordinated international baseline, as I say, is what is needed. Uh, to basically reinstill in our leadership that the sun does rise from the east and sets in the west, and that that's where I would approach it from. Was well, I, I haven't heard this, but I, Nisha, and you know this as well. But you know, wh why would climate denying be associated with uh, countries that are historically white, male-dominated? Um, speaking English, a Queen's English. Um, w w how could that be? <laughs> well, the easiest answer is that they were in power. They were running the coal companies. 20 major energy companies in the world dominate the energy industry. And th they have the 10 of the top 15. And, and therefore, they're breeding denial. <laughs> like, it, there's an Occam's razor to that that I would suggest is is at work. I, I'm tempted to say things like, um, we did kind of mistakenly made climate science like really sophisticated climate models need to be used. Like, no, CO2 traps heat, simple. Like, whether we wanted to characterize it as like really exotic science or not, or we, or we actually needed to back in the 80s and the early 90s when that was sort of all we had. We didn't have all the, the, the monitors that we do today. But in that period of time, portraying it as extremely complex that only a few people could understand, only experts can tell you this, that that meta-messaging was 
doomed if you if you do if you try to convey the masses of anything where that's the first thing coming out of your mouth and uh, going back to your point about uh, how do we all become scientists or can have more scientific thinking but I, I'd say that scientific thinking uh, may sound like a lofty goal but um, maybe we can all do reasoning and reasoning sounds like a little easier and maybe when we explain reasoning um, to others that tells us something about our inner selves uh, which was an earlier topic but let me ask a panel a question that's about your inner selves. Um, and so this week, um, when you were faced with a perverse incentive, because we all do, and we have choices, and I find it really interesting when we have to translate principles into choices in our everyday lives. What was a uh, perverse incentive that you saw, and what was your imperfect choice, probably, uh, in that case, and why did you choose the way you chose? So I, I won't, um, yeah, so you're right that I think every day and every week there are kind of big choices and um, certainly this week is no shortage in terms of, you know, I'm involved in, uh, you heard an introduction, a big treaty around kind of life on the oceans and there's a big uh, perverse incentive and regulatory capture about those who want to do seabed mining, for example. So um, even though they proclaim to be doing a, you know, a sustainable ocean economy, it's clear that it's not. It's just, And so when you're faced with those choices, I think one of the big questions at the core of what you're asking is, um, where's your courage? Right? Do you have the courage to stand up? Do you have the courage to let go of the institutions or the organizations or the labels that you have um, and to stand, stand up for your values? And where does those values and where does that North Star come from? Um, you know, so, so to the points about kind of education, I had some themes and some questions on education and I had a lot about the kind of rational thinking. Um, to that, so this session that we were in in, in India, um, one of the big kind of... Um, uh, revelations that the the Dalai Lama has had. What was interesting, it's a small group around science and spirituality. And he recognizes one of his big legacies is that um, the Tibetan people may, um, may be a, a people in, in exile for however many years, whether it's 10 years, decades, centuries, thousands of years. And so they're now reconciling the fact that they're no longer going to be in the homeland of Tibet, which had been ravaged by climate change in terms of the melting of the ice caps that's changing the, the landscape as well as cultural and political factors. And so one of his big legacies is how does he then train uh, the 10,000 um, Buddhist monks that are outside into the values of science, for example, because he sees that you know, the, um, uh, in Tibetan culture, uh, one of the big assets is kind of that rational thinking, but also scientific thinking. How do you uh, find something which is compatible? But rather than just looking at the rational side, he's introduced this new education curriculum around the social, emotional, and ethical side of thinking, which he thinks is undervalued in our modern education system. And so to the points that, I don't know whether yourself or somebody else was making about, are we creating workers of the futures? Are we preparing um, kind of the adults of the future uh, in terms of leadership, how can those sorts of tools that we're not comfortable with give us the courage to address those perverse incentives? Because even if you encounter perverse incentives, it's not your left brain logical thinking that will overcome that. It's going to be something a bit more creative and even a little bit lower within you that may not be taught at school today that we'll need to develop. So, um. yeah, I, I can tell you one I face every day and one that became apparent to me uh, last week when my mom was here and she asked me when I was moving back to India. And I think this perverse incentive of, if I care so much about the global south, why am I sitting in San Francisco, <laughs> right? And that is a very, very tough one. And I'm here because there are R&D dollars spent in India. Just, just there's, there's no R&D spending where I am creatively inclined to be b with the best scientists. Uh, but I also remind myself that I'm in this basement with the best scientists that are working on biotechnology for human and planetary health. And I think for me, it comes with taking pride in being an immigrant and actually just embracing that label of being an immigrant uh, and in the hopes that the science we are creating downstairs will transcend these colonial national borders. So that's that's, I guess, my best answer I can give you. But yeah, that's one that... Hopefully, over time, I'll reconcile with, yeah. Thanks for sharing. That's great. <clears throat>
So one example that I faced this week, um, and uh, it always, I think it faces a lot of um, biotech startups, is this question about how you scale in a humane way. Because if you, if you have science that has a bottleneck in it of some sort or another, and any scientific process always has a bottleneck, uh, you can increase that aperture by just hiring people somewhat quickly and haphazardly. Uh, maybe, you know, adequate people with adequate skills, you know, to force, force that, that bottleneck wider and, and, and get your work done. Uh, but then the, the question, uh, the moral question that always faces uh, uh, the CEO of the company and I uh, is how do we do this in a way that we don't have to lay people out, off if, if we buy a robot uh, that greatly increases that, that slow step or maybe makes that slow step no longer the slowest in the pipeline. And, uh, and, and so this, this necessitates a more difficult hiring process because instead of optimizing for someone whose CV you know, one can check each skill that they have, each particular skill. Uh, we optimize more for, is this person, does this person show that they can learn new things quickly and has creativity and mental plasticity? Because if you hire people like that, who are much harder to screen for, in my opinion, uh, and require a, just a more difficult hiring process, uh, uh, you end up with something that's sustainable. And I, I can't say that uh, in my career at, at this and other companies, hiring people, I've always done that perfectly, but I think it's, it's a moral issue that, that faces us and we have to uh, take the more expensive route to, for a better long-term outcome. Um, I think it comes down to alternatives. What are our alternatives? So when I drive my car somewhere, um, there is, uh, I feel bad about it, but I think that's the best choice for me at the time. And so what we're really committed to downstairs here at IndieBio is creating better alternatives so that um, we don't have to make that choice in the future. And so I justify a lot of what I do, bad choices I make throughout the day by using plastic, if I drink up out of a plastic bottle, or it's, it's a horrible, horrible feeling, and I'm aware of it, but I justify it by saying I'm creating more alternatives or part of a movement to create more alternatives to a better future. You guys are all much better than me because my, my, my compromises, which great, to, great question actually to bring it home because I mean my compromises are very personal every single day. I don't take care of my health, my, my creative work, my family. My, my work colleagues, my job, uh, my extended family, or let alone stuff outside the house, let alone the environment, let alone, like, like they are fighting a war every single day for my time. And I'm compromising them and rationalizing every single day, uh, with, without a doubt, and walk around half the time feeling like I can never make everybody happy. And I'm only talking about myself. Um, and don't have a solution to that, especially during a period of time. Arvin and I are working on a book right now, so especially during a time where I'm trying to find some time of the day to write a thousand or two thousand words in the middle of the night if I need to. Um, and I, it's extremely selfish to sort of like to actually to be sitting with dinner with people and not being present because I'm thinking half the time, what am I going to write tonight when I get up in the middle of the night? Like that's that is the nature of my life, I hope not to hurt too many people with it. And the most perverse thing that's happened to me is that I've had the truth obfuscated of who we are, where we come from, what our purpose is, and how to connect back to that source and embody it moving forward. And I'm grateful to indigenous wisdom that I've been taught recently that has helped me better embody that on a moment to moment basis. And that's the end of the Q and A. So thank you to everyone for your questions. Thanks to our panelists. Another round of applause for everyone. All right, and now before we start the work groups, uh, Greg Bilkey, 
Yes. Come on up, Greg. Has some words to say about the Remembering Rosalind Franklin project that it's in partnership with BioCaptivate. Um, hi. Um, I'm working right now with uh, Jan Lewis and uh, Laura Tendesky over there on the early development for a new project um, for BioCaptivate that is going to be launched in late 2019. As you can see there, it's uh, called um, Remember Rosalind, and that is the name of our website, uh, rememberrosalind.org. And <clears throat> I'll read the uh, description here because it sums things up pretty well. Uh, Remember Rosalind is an interactive, serialized presentation using augmented reality and online learning resources to explore the story, science, and controversy surrounding Rosalind Franklin's contributions during the race to discover the structure of DNA and how they can be relevant today. And what we're looking at this project is being a collaboration between uh, scientists, artists, and historian, historians, and it will be presented over a three-month uh, period uh, via updates to our website and also an augmented reality app. And the audience will be able to uh, interact with us uh, via online forums. Um, posting comments will be able to uh, ask questions. Uh, we're in just the early stages of developing this right now, so I suggest if uh, you'd like more information on it, uh, go to the website, rememberrosalind.org, and uh, sign up for the mailing list, and there'll be more um, information coming in the months ahead. And also tonight, uh, we'll set up a little uh, demo uh, so you can see uh, one of the uh, augmented reality uh, pieces uh, actually up live. And um, Oh, also, you'd be able to sign up for the mailing list. Uh, we're really looking forward to uh, 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 developing and presenting this project. I think it's going to be an interesting and engaging uh, project for uh, all types of audiences. And uh, we hope you guys join us. Thanks.